Amen. We're going to see him face to face. Amen. Let's go ahead and please be seated. And uh, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter number 25. And uh, (coughs) looking here at Jesus' illustrations, of course, we looked at the teaching. Matthew chapter 25. Chapter 24, dealing with a time of judgment upon this earth to come. The tribulation period that is going to come upon this earth. And Jesus, a great illustrator, he goes on to give three illustrations as uh, we consider the judgment to come. Uh, The Bible speaks of the rapture. Praise the Lord as a Christian. I'm looking forward to the rapture. And uh, I'm not looking forward to the tribulation period. Nobody looks forward to the tribulation period anyway. But uh, as we uh, look at uh, the tribulation period, chapter 24, chapter 25, uh, I believe that uh, that uh, the Bible is going to be read during the tribulation period. And uh, the Jewish people are going to be preached to. In fact, the Bible speaks of 144,000 Jews, preachers, going to be traveling across this world preaching the gospel. And and a part of those passages I believe they'll preach will be Chapters 24 and 25, when you're living in the tribulation and uh, they begin to share uh, those things already prophesied about in the word of God, uh, then uh, to come to these three illustrations in chapter 25, uh, I believe as Christians, though, we're looking forward to the tribulation period. And with that in mind, these three illustrations also uh, still would uh, would uh, come to uh, to uh, uh, importance as uh, we look at them and and uh, the Lord's soon coming. Uh, judgment is coming and uh, we know that in the end of the world uh, the judgment of the wicked is going to take place and and uh, of course with the with the rapture uh, there is going to be a judgment Christians will be taken out of this place and and there'll be two groups of people those in the air and those upon this earth Uh, the Christians will be gone the Holy Spirit uh, in the Christians be taken away he that now letteth shall be taken out of the way the Bible says Uh, and yet then once tribulation period begins, uh, people are going to start getting saved again. And uh, and so we're going to find uh, the Bible says a great number. No man can count of all nations, tongues and languages is going to be saved during the tribulation period, as well as one third of the Jewish nation is going to turn to the Lord uh, during that time. And and uh, and then after that, the Lord is going to return and uh, with his angels and judge the nations. And so we're uh, we're looking at here, uh, you know, a, a judgment to come. And uh, uh, verse number 31 of chapter 25, uh, he's just given three illustrations. We're looking at the third of those today. The first one was the ten virgins with the ten lamps waiting for the bridegroom to come. And uh, five of them had oil in their lamps and five did not. Uh, Five uh, were saved and five weren't. But all of them were asleep. And uh, if we're not careful as Christians, as uh, we uh, think of uh, this time, if the tribulation period isn't waking Christians up, uh, then uh, can you imagine, uh, you know, the, the Christians asleep in this time? You could have five with oil and five without oil, and all of them were asleep when the bridegroom came. And uh, the five were content that the other five had no oil. Uh, a lot of Christians were, uh, were uh, uh, not uh, sharing the gospel with uh, those that were right there with them. The five that didn't have the oil, they still look for the bridegroom. They still expected to go when he came. And, uh, uh, of course, they did not because they were not saved. Uh, there's a lot today that would say they're Christians. They name the name of Christ, and, and uh, yet they're not. And uh, judgment is coming. And then we look at the second illustration of the man who went into a far country, and he left his three servants with talents and time. And the Bible says a long time that he left them with. The Lord's left us with a long time, hasn't he? Uh, and talents. Now, some had five talents, and there are some very talented people in this world, aren't there? And uh, But uh, you look at two talents, that'd be a, a blessing. Most of us here today, we're one talented, if we can call us one. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, the Bible says not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty. Uh, he's chosen to call the the, the foolish uh, to uh, there or the uh, the uh, uh, weak or the, the the base. 
And uh, and so the, the one talented and if we look there, the uh, the one talented, he only had one talent to be responsible for. And yet he went and he buried it in this earth and did nothing with it. Uh, and the Lord returned. He had nothing to give back except what the Lord had given him. He just returned back. And and uh, of course, we uh, we find there the uh, the problem. He wasn't saved in the first place. He was called the servant of God. He was given a talent to be used. And and yet uh, we find he wasn't saved. And and uh, and all of a sudden that that's why he didn't use that talent. Um, and then we come to the. Shepherd separating the goats from the sheep, you know, it's shearing time. It's shearing time and and uh, and so at shearing time, the uh, the uh, shepherd would have goats and sheep and together as they would care for them. And and yet at shearing time, uh, the sheep were produced for wool. Uh, they didn't uh, harvest the sheep. They didn't uh, kill the sheep and eat the meat. What were goats good for? Well, they were good meat. Uh, at least, you know, in that part of the country, you say, I don't, I don't care. A lot. You know, we, uh, we give me the beef. But uh, but, uh, uh, you know, they uh, uh, they uh, they ate the, the, the goat. And, and so they would separate. And and uh, of course, the goats, they'd go off to butcher and and uh, the, the sheep, they'd go off to fleecing. And and uh, they, they'd uh, you know, it, it'd be better to be a sheep than a goat. Right. Life was a little bit longer. Uh, you uh, you had some uh, some benefit. Unless you happen to be a goat that gave good milk, then uh, you know they, they'd keep some of them. But uh, but uh, the the goats they were for uh, for for meat, and the sheep they they were for wool. And and so the shepherd comes to uh, that uh, time of uh, shearing, and and uh, they would uh, take and divide, and they'd separate the the, the two flocks. And you have the sheep and the goats, and and uh, goats herd though, right? And uh, so you got the uh, the herd of goats and the and the flock of sheep, and and uh, so he'd separate those uh, those two and. And uh, of course, you can picture the shepherd saying, "You're going to the uh, to get a haircut. You're going for fleecing to those on his right hand, left hand. Uh, you're you're going to the chopping block. Uh, you're going to the chopping block. And you know, just like that, the Bible says it's going to be when the Lord comes. Uh, judgment takes place in the rapture. It's going to be to the Christians. Listen, you're going for fleecing in heaven. Praise the Lord. Uh, going to give you not only a haircut, a complete makeover, a uh, glorified body, a new creature, and." And, uh, uh, you know, uh, the older are going to become young and the younger are going to get a little bit older and be matured a little bit. And and uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're going to be in heaven with him. And uh, the other side, though, you got the goats and they're going to have to le- stay here and go through the tribulation period. And uh, I don't expect the chopping block is, is very good. In fact, the Bible says literally during the tribulation period, those that uh, that uh, uh, get saved, many of them are going to go through the guillotine. And uh, just a horrible, a horrible time. Much easier to be saved today by grace, and and you'll be saved by grace too. But uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to the rapture, and and uh, not to uh, to that time. Although Christians through time have also had to stand to the guillotine, and and uh, many are suffering persecution even today uh, in other countries, and and it's in America we got it pretty good. But <coughs> as we look at uh, here, this uh, this judgment that's going to take place again is third illustration. Uh, trying to prepare the hearts of people for that judgment to come. And so we're going to look at the title of the message this morning, If You Say So. If You Say So. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to open your word again. And uh, Lord, as we uh, get to hear from you today and read this illustration, the very words that your son Jesus Christ uh, shared as he taught the multitudes. Uh, Lord, this is going to be one of the passages that will be read during the tribulation period that hopefully will bring others to Christ and to your son, Jesus Christ, to be saved. And and uh, Father, as we uh, uh, think of the uh, the rapture to come, uh, Lord, there's going to be many that have heard the gospel and and uh, put off uh, salvation. But there's many others, as you've showed in these illustrations that uh, thought they were Christians, said they were Christians, never became born again. Father, I pray that you would uh, bless the the message this morning. And uh, Lord, it would just be a a blessing and benefit to us. And Lord, also a motivation as we uh, as we uh, uh, continue to realize the importance of not sleeping 
during this age we live. Uh, content because we're saved, but uh, Lord, we'll be awake and watchful and burdened because others are not. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You could probably admit with me today, everyone that names the name of Christ is not saved. Uh, there's many that would call themselves Christians uh, today that uh, don't even know what a Christian is. Uh, and uh, uh, there's many that teach a, a false gospel. Uh, and the people in those uh, church, very content, like the five uh, virgins there waiting for the Lord to come. And yet, I mean, in fact, so content, they're asleep. Uh, so content, not concerned, they don't have any oil. Uh, and uh, maybe they didn't realize they didn't have it. Uh, it's kind of hard to picture, though, in their days, they used those little oil lamps. Uh, that was part of their life. They, uh, they would use them daily. It was the only light source they had. You didn't flip on the light switch and. And uh, they knew very well that you need oil in those. And and uh, and so as they, uh, you know, uh, would uh, would uh, uh, go through the uh, the effort to have the lamp, but uh, not uh, any oil in it. And and uh, we, we look. Uh, but 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 the title of the message, if you say so. You ever uh, seen somebody fall? And of course, your immediate response is, are you OK? As you reach down to help them up, or maybe you've fallen. And somebody else has said, are you okay? And reaches down to uh, lift you up. Uh, I don't know why it is, but it's embarrassing to fall, isn't it? Uh, and uh, to trip and fall, isn't that embarrassing? Uh, in fact, when I fall, I, I really don't realize that I'm in pain until after I get back up and make sure nobody's looking. Uh, why I'm more concerned about what people think than... Uh, whether I got hurt and, and and so as you, uh, you know, maybe have somebody come and and uh, say, uh, are you OK and help you up? And. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Are you sure? Oh, yeah, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, what's the next thing they would say? If you say so. Uh, it's pretty evident you aren't, but if you say so, I'm not going to be rude here. If you say so, the, the statement, if you say so, uh, it indicates continued concern in response to the attempts to put you at ease. In other words, you've tried to convince them that you're okay, and yet there's still a concern on them to say, well, if you say so, uh, you know, uh, uh, it sure doesn't look like you're fine, but if you say so. It can also be used politely to disagree or imply that someone is lying. Uh, why? Because I see your limp. Uh, you know, or uh, maybe you fell and you, you hit your arm and you got blood draining down your, your, your arm and your sleeve and dripping off on the ground. Are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. Uh, want me to take you to the hospital? No, I'll walk there on my own, uh, you know, and get there. And uh, If you say so. You ever ask somebody if they're a Christian and they say, oh, yes, I'm a Christian. Uh, well, I can't tell it. Uh, are you sure you're saved? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, let me ask you. Uh, why is it that you think you're a Christian? Just leave me alone. I'm fine. Many are lost, and they're fine. They're lost, and they're fine. And probably one of the most difficult things to get people saved is to get them lost. Uh, why, everybody's fine. Uh, it's very difficult. But, you know, a person who's lost, it's easy to get them saved. Why? Because salvation's a gift. Point to Jesus Christ and they get saved. But uh, those that are lost, uh, there's, there's many in America. Uh, many that go to church every week, and yet they're not Christians. And uh, I'd like to look at this illustration that Jesus gives and just with the coming rapture in mind, of course, his point is the 
into the tribulation and the judgment as Christ comes forth to set up his kingdom on this earth. And and uh, this this illustration that he uses. And things that he says here, notice, if you would, in. Verse number 31, when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And so you picture here as he's uh, coming to separate the herd or the flock or the herd flock. It's a sheep and goats together. And uh, so he's going to separate them. You know, when the Lord comes in the air, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats, isn't he? I guess you could say it. Uh, the other side, when he comes at the end of the world, he's, uh, at the end of the tribulation, he's going to separate the, the goats from the sheep. Uh, he's going to send the goats off and the sheep are going to enter into the kingdom. But uh, here, uh, you know, we, we find as he, he, he begins to separate the sheep and the goats and and uh, uh, the first thing as we look at this account, just to remind you this morning, judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. Uh, you know, I praise the Lord that uh, that I'm not looking for the great white throne judgment. The Bible assures me uh, my sins are forgiven. Jesus Christ went to the cross and he paid it all. Uh, he paid the debt. My sins are gone. When Jesus Christ looks at me today, or when God the Father looks at me today through Jesus Christ, I've been put, his righteousness has been put on me. He doesn't see Bruce Perkins' righteousness. Well, where's Bruce Perkins' righteousness? He doesn't have any. The Bible says all your righteousnesses are as a filthy rag. That's what our garments look like. And the Bible says that when you got saved, uh, he took your sins and he placed upon you his righteousness. And so when he looks at me and doesn't see those sins, and I'm not going to stand before God and God to show a, a movie of all my life and all the sins that I did. And, and uh, just want you to know and everybody else that all these things and, uh, you know, in, in, uh, uh, the, in Bruce's life uh, that he did all these thoughts, all these words, all these uh, these things. Just kind of want to rub it in his face before I let him go into heaven. And uh, so going to give you, uh, you know, all this. It's amazing how these teachings like purgatory come up. It says when you die, you're going to go to this place of suffering and suffer for your sins for a while and then go to heaven. Uh, when Jesus went to the cross, he died for it all. Uh, he died for every one of them. The Bible says he died for your sins, not only you, Propitiation of your sins, not yours only, but the sins of the whole world. The Bible speaks for the Christian of the judgment seat of Christ. When you get to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and there's going to be gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. And it's going to be tried with fire. And uh, even if it is all burned up, even if there's nothing in my life of value, I'll still be able to, to be in heaven. Uh, but I hope there's something there that would be of value that uh, I would have to be able to lay at Jesus' feet because it's not me, it's Christ who's done it through me. But there is coming a judgment day for the Christian. Uh, and we are going to be given an account. I don't believe it's going to be a comfortable thing. I really don't. Uh, there's going to be a lot of things that God's going to, you know, uh, uh, kind of picture as, as uh, uh, Deborah came to Barak. And uh, uh, talk about humbling. It says, uh, has not the Lord directed you to lead us against Sisera? And well, if you go with me, uh, how'd you know about that? Uh, there's a lot of things. I mean, God speaks to our heart to do or to not to do. And and as we, uh, uh, you know, obedient and, and uh, we're going to uh, we're going to look at uh, like in the last the. Uh, the uh, uh, three servants with the talents and and there's going to come a day of judgment uh, where he's going to ask, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with the life that I saved? Uh, you know, we're not our own. We're bought with a price. Somebody comes to you and say, how is it that you can give every Sunday morning up to go to church? Uh, I haven't given up anything. It's his. Sunday is the Lord's, isn't it? Monday's the Lord's, Tuesday's the Lord's, Wednesday's the Lord's, Thursday's the Lord's, Friday's the Lord's. And the problem is, as I look at it as mine, uh, if it's not yours, you don't ever sacrifice it, do you? 
If it's your money, you sacrifice it for the Lord. If, if it's not your money, there's no sacrifice. It's his. My time, uh, those things are, are his. The problem is I get possessive, don't I? And I start to think those things are mine. There's coming a day of judgment. What did you do with what I gave you? you know, what did you do? Uh, well, you gave it to me to do what I wanted with it, right? Uh, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you're bought with a price. You're not your own. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are his. And uh, uh, so he's given it to us for his glory to be used for him. But we begin to look at it as mine. Uh, it's my house. It's my car. It's my things. It's my. Uh, and that's why it's hard for us to give it up. Or to use it for the glory of God because it's mine. There's coming a judgment. I'd like you to notice verse 41. The Bible says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, and everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Secondly, hell is a real place, isn't it? Uh, the only one who ever speaks of hell as being a parable is the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists. Hell is a real place. It's a place of torment. It's everlasting. And there's going to be many that are going to be there for all eternity. It says, depart from me, you cursed, and everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for us, was it? Prepared for the devil and his angels, but still amongst the nations, there's the goats on the left hand that he's going to say, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. There's going to be people suffering there too, along with the devil and his angels, the demons. Hell is a real place. And we need hellfire and brimstone preaching. And don't let the world convince you otherwise. You hear that so much from people today that even preachers start to believe it. Can't mention that place, hell. You might scare somebody into heaven. Uh, well, don't we want people to get saved? Uh, even if it's, the Bible says, it's by fire with fear. Uh, save some. Jesus spoke often of hell, and he didn't speak of it as a parable. He spoke of it as the truth, and it's a real place. And so we see hell is a real place. Look at, uh, hold your place there. Look, look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Backed by revelations in the neighborhood anyway. Second Peter chapter number three. Verse number nine. The Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. As some men count slackness. But is long suffering to us word not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. The truth is, God did not make hell for us. God made hell for the devil and his angels. But God is a just God. And he does say that those that are found guilty of sin will spend an eternity in a place called hell. By the very fact that Jesus would give us these three illustrations, we can see that God is not willing that any perish. His point in the illustrations is to scare people into heaven. If you want to look at the scare, at least make you nervous a little bit. Am I the one with the oil or without? Am I the one that's using God what gave me or am I the one that's not using what God gave uh, for his glory? Is there a concern in my heart? To use what God gave. You might be a lazy Christian. Not using what God gave. But there's at least the burden. 
I need to be using what God's gave. Or as we come to this one, are, am I a sheep or am I a goat? Am I a sheep or am I a goat? He's not willing that any perish. God wants everyone to be saved. Uh, there's no one alive today that's unsavable. Jesus Christ says he died for the whole world. No matter how horrible and wretched a person might appear, God could still save them. We need to be burdened that they hear the gospel, that they have that opportunity and multiple opportunities. God is long-suffering. If we just hurry up and get them saved, then maybe Jesus will come sooner, you think? Because he's putting off because he's just waiting. Maybe he's waiting on you. You're right there in 2 Peter. Look at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John. First John, chapter number four. Chapter four. First John, chapter number four, and just hold your place there. I want to read a little bit from Matthew, chapter twenty-five. The Bible says, in verse number thirty-three, and he shall set on the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the king prepared for you from the found, or the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came to me. And then I just want to read another passage. Again, you're looking at 1 John chapter 4. Verse 42, he says, For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we then hunger, or thirsty, or strange, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? If you would notice 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. 1 If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God love his brother also. We find in this parable Jesus expressing there that as we demonstrate love to the least of these his brethren, we demonstrate love to him. If you're saved, you demonstrate love to the least of your brethren. If you're not, you don't. The Bible says if we love him, uh, or if we say we love him and hate our brother, then we're liars. Uh, we're liars. And there in Matthew chapter 25, in this illustration, we find Jesus expressing that when he says that as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. But he says to the goats, as you've not done this to the least of my brethren, you've not done it unto me. Be careful how we treat others. Say, oh, I love God. I just can't stand that guy that sits on the other side of the church. I love God. I just can't seem to care much for that neighbor that's next to me that person that I know that has need. The Bible says, as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. It, it, I, I think it would affect our 
our walk a little bit. If every time we did something for somebody, we pictured, I'm doing this for Jesus. That should be the motive anyway. The Bible says even a cup of cold water given in his name. Uh, or because of the name of a disciple. Just because he's one of God's servants. We gave him a cup of cold water. Uh, the Bible says it not go unrewarded. And uh, we say, oh, I love God. Just can't stand people. Uh, you know what God says? You're a liar. You need to check if you're saved. Uh, the Bible says examine yourselves. Say, oh, you're just trying to cause me to doubt. I, I hope that that's not the case this morning. Uh, but Jesus did give these illustrations, and he was talking to the multitudes listening to him because he wanted to shake them up a little bit. Are you saved? Here we find the sin of omission. Uh, we forget about the sins of omission. We're, we're good with the sins of commission. You're not supposed to lie, right? Brother Paul, you're not supposed to steal. Uh, we tell Uriah and Rand, don't call your brother names. God doesn't like that. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Uh, but there's lots of sins of omission. What's omission? That means we don't do what God tells us to do. Uh, the Holy Spirit directed in our hearts, and we just said no. Or we said not right now, which kind of means no. Uh, we notice here in this particular illustration, Jesus is centering on the sin of omission. So often people will say, uh, you know, are you going to heaven? I've never killed anybody. Well, great, you aren't, uh, you aren't, you aren't guilty of committing uh, murder or a sin of commission. But you know, there's a lot of instructions God's given to Christians in the Bible. And you know what an instruction from God is? That's not a, I can choose to do it or not. I have a free will, right? It's a command. Uh, God's suggestions are commands. And, uh, you know, as, 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 as God directs and, and uh, the, the Holy Spirit directs in, in, every day, we, we, uh, if you were to begin to add up all of the sins of omission in your life. And so in this particular illustration, uh, there's probably many in Jesus' day, like the, the young, rich young ruler that came and said, uh, you know, I've done all these things for my youth, and he gives him the Ten Commandments. Well, I've, I, I, I've not broken those. He could probably go on with a great list and say, well, what about all these others? In fact, what did he do? He said, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, well, what, what was he guilty of? The sin of omission. Uh, he didn't do what, what God told him to do. What can I do to inherit eternal life? Well, just sell all you have and go give it to the poor and come follow me. And uh, so he gave him a command, didn't he? And he says, no, I can't do that. And he went away sorrowful. Sins of omission. But I believe here that we look at this particular account and look back at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Back to the title of the message, if, if you say so. If you say so, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, amazing here that all the nations were surprised. All the nations were surprised. I mean, the Bible says that when Jesus came and he lined up the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left hand, the sheep were just as surprised as the goats. Notice the Bible says here in verse 31, or verse 32, it says, Now learn the parable, I'm in chapter 24, apologize. Verse number 33. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison. And ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer and say, saying, Lord, 
when saw we thee and hunger and fed thee. Can you sense the surprise there? I don't remember seeing you at any time. When saw we thee hunger and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? The king shall answer and say unto him, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. There are those that take this illustration and they teach a work salvation. See, the difference between the saved and the lost is the saved gave to the poor. The lost didn't. It was their works that saved them. I want you to notice the surprise of the saved, the sheep. Obviously, they weren't doing these things to get to heaven. When saw we thee? When did we do all these things that you're talking about? Well, when you did the least of these, my brethren, you did to them. Uh, you know, uh, loving your neighbor is a natural product of being saved. Loving your neighbor will never make you saved. If you think if I love my neighbor and if I give all of my goods to the poor and if I uh, sacrifice my life, then I'll get to heaven. Uh, you're fooling yourself. The Bible says if you're saved, you'll do those things. Those things don't make you saved. You can try to do all those things if you want to, but that won't make you saved. But because you're saved, you do those things. The other side of it is we can go on and look at it, but we're not. Uh, those that are lost, he says, you didn't do these things. He says, when did we ever see you? naked or in prison or uh, without I mean with without food or I mean all those uh, needing it thirsty or uh, when, when do we we would have done it if that's what we needed to do we would have done it why because we want to go to heaven we want to enter the kingdom we don't want to be goats how does the shepherd separate the sheep from the goats I, I can guarantee you he doesn't cut off their head and look inside uh, how does he do it? He can tell by the way they look. They look different, don't they? The title of the message, if you say so. You can do all you want to convince me that you're saved. The Lord doesn't need to cut off your head to look inside. He, he can look inside, but uh, I don't believe he's given this to say, let's go out and be examiners. Let's go out and examine and watch Brother James's life and see, is he really saved? You know, the Bible says, show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. But uh, uh, let me examine. I want to be a Christian examiner. Start examining people. See if they're saved. That's not what he's talking about. He wants you to examine yourself. Uh, are these things a natural byproduct of your life or are you in trouble? You can do all you want to convince me that you're okay. It really doesn't matter. Who am I? A sinner that God gave a mouth to and a little bit of a brain so that I could at least read and be able to take and then the Holy Spirit to teach me the word of God that I could preach some of it. But uh, Jesus Christ is the Savior. You've got to convince him. Uh, go ahead and try to convince him that you're saved when you're not. He's the shepherd. He's the one that's going to divide the sheep from the goats. You can stand before him and you can say, my mom told me I was saved. Uh, well, your mom is not the inspector. Uh, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? Is there evidence of it in your life? Uh, that, that statement, and I wrote it down here just so I wouldn't get it wrong, but uh, it says, uh, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Think about that. If you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? There's a lot of people that you'll meet, and you can ask them, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Uh, after a while, you, you find out almost everybody's a Christian, aren't they, in America? Uh, almost everybody is. 
it's amazing some sometimes when we'll uh, it used to be that if you were living in sin you were embarrassed to tell people you were a Christian I don't want anybody to know uh, now it's no problem yeah I'm a, I'm a Christian I find a lot of people can give a testimony of salvation they can talk about how they trusted Christ as their savior and prayed and grace saves them and all those things and and uh, uh, but there's no evidence in life and you just have to leave it there if you say so because one day we're going to stand before the Lord and the rapture is going to take place and you're either going to be still sitting here or you're going to be in heaven uh, and that goes for me too I, I'm saying you but uh, do you have an assurance that you are saved not have you said a prayer, have you repented of your sins and trusted Christ as your Savior? Uh, from your heart. Have you repented of your sins and asked Christ to save you? The fruits of the Spirit should be those things which as God works in us, uh, and we surrender ourselves to him. I'm not saying you can't have a backslidden Christian. You can. I was one of them. I knew I was a saved. There wasn't a doubt about my salvation. But uh, I'd like to think my life was probably a lot better at that time than it would have been if I had been lost. But still, and there was a conviction of right and wrong and and a, a grieving over the wrong. and and uh, But... By their fruits you shall know them. You might have saw me and said he's a heathen. Uh, but you don't have to convince me. It's the Lord who you need to convince. As we conclude this last illustration that Jesus gives, and knowing uh, there is coming a judgment day. Are you sure you're saved? If there's some doubt, make sure. You know, the Bible does tell us if we have a brother that's in sin and such that uh, we're to, to what? Treat him like a lost person. How do you treat a lost person? You love them, you pray for them, you share the gospel with them, you desire to get saved. They may be saved. Uh, but how do we know? It's kind of like after you help me get up and are you fine? I'm okay. You don't look okay. Are you sure? I'm okay. Well, if you say so, I'll pray for you anyway. Uh, you sure look like you got a limp to me. Uh, there's, there's many you wonder, wh how can a Christian be saved and live like that? And one day they get saved. Uh, praise the Lord, then their life changes. And you, you say, that's why. That was why. All those years that uh, they tried to convince me they were a Christian, they were saved, and everything was okay, and Finally, the Holy Spirit convicted their heart and they repented and they asked Christ to save them. Don't come to the point of complacency as a Christian, thinking everybody's a Christian, nobody needs to be saved. But don't also come to the place where you say, oh, I'm not, they don't need the gospel. I shared it with them once and that was it. Fulfilled my duty. I hope it's more than a duty, it's a burden. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. A duty is, I've shared the gospel with them once, they don't need to hear it again. A burden is when you're there at their door for the tenth time. Uh, having something else at church this week, would you like to come? We just want to give you an invitation and just remind you the gospel's here on the back. And, and uh, would this be a good time for me to share the gospel with you? Like I told you last time. Well. Praise the Lord, at least hope you'll come. But well, after a while, they'll just get mad. The Bible does say those that often reprove harden their neck and then comes destruction. But you know, it might be the last time you ever they ever get to hear the gospel before they go into eternity. It's important that we give it to them. Out of love, not because you're trying to be a contentious, irritable person. Want to mess up their day but I want them to be saved let's stand as we have the invitation this morning
There is coming a judgment, a judgment for Christians as well. How will the Lord find us and what state will he find us when he comes? Used to do this, used to be this, or I've given more of my life to the Lord now than I've ever given before. He's coming. If you're not saved, today's the day of salvation. You could ask Christ to save you today if there's some doubt. Ask God for that assurance. Uh, desire that assurance to know that you're safe so there's no doubt. And if the message that Jesus gave, the illustration today, would shake you up a little bit to make you question and think, am I really saved and you still have that assurance, praise the Lord. We're saved by grace, through faith. It's not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. Not by works, lest any man should boast. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the illustrations that your son gave us while he was here upon this earth. And Lord, your concern for our eternal soul. Also, knowing as Christians, there's coming a, a day of judgment. We need to continually be reminded that this life that uh, we live, it's not ours. Your love has constrained us. But Lord, we would give our life to you. And Father, I uh, know that often we get selfish and we try to take it back as ours and use it as we please. And, uh, and we waste much of it in doing that. Uh, Lord, what could be done through our life if we would completely surrender to you? Uh, I pray that you might continue that work in us. Lord, we just give you another piece of us today. Again, thank you, Father, for this time of invitation. and. Uh, as your Holy Spirit works, Lord, you would uh, find us obedient and submitted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.